And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kramer. Dr. Kramer is a residency trained optometrist in Miami, Florida, who specializes in ocular surface disease and regular and specialty contact lens fitting. Her doctorate degree was awarded at, in optometry from the University de Montreal, where she received a grant from the scholarship program of the Quebec Ministry of Education for short-term university studies outside of Quebec. During her fourth year, she completed her internship in ocular disease at the Ice Centers of South Florida and went on to complete her residency at the Miami VA Medical Center. Her time there included training at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, the nation's top eye, high, eye hospital. After her residency, Dr. Kramer became a fellow of the Scleral Lens Society and now serves as public education chair elect for the SLS. Dr. Kramer is, uh, is, a, is one of my best friends in the whole world. We, we are soul sisters. We talk to each other all the time. I mean, I feel like we're the same person, but just on different sides of the U.S. And we are so lucky to hear from you. I cannot wait to learn and welcome Dr. Kramer. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. And honestly, congratulations to Dr. Stephanie Wu for revolutionizing virtual education. This is really, really special and just a true honor to be part of um, this, this project. And I hope to collaborate more with uh, Wu University. So as Dr. Wu alluded to, it is so important to take care of the ocular surface, the eyelids. Um, we learn from Dr. Denaire, Dr. Sin, Dr. Carrasquillo, some of the best in the industry, just how to design scleral lenses. And they can be the best scleral lens in the world, but if the ocular surface disease is not taken care of, then it just won't work the right way. And so in order to optimize the way that a scleral lens works, the way it corrects the vision, the comfort of it, and everything involved with scleral lens wear, the ocular surface really has to be taken under control. And so we are optometrists, we are medically trained in optometry, and it's so important to not just take care of the vision and design the lens. And obviously that's primordial in, in you know, improving vision and regular corneas, ocular surface disease, but we do have to take care of the eyelids. And I'm excited to share this for, with you because actually dry eye and ocular surface disease is definitely one of my passions. Scleral lenses is something that I love and it's so rewarding. And I think that ocular surface disease and dry eye and eyelid health is something that I'm equally passionate about because I find that they go hand in hand. So these are my financial disclosures. And it, it's hard to talk about dry eye without alluding to this study. And this is one of the best and, and most important studies in dry eye uh, today. It's the Tierfoss Dues 2 study, which has really outlined so many important aspects of dry eye and really um, helped us understand it better. Dry eye is such a complex condition. It's such a complex disease. And so many people are affected by it that it's so important for us to really understand um, everything about it. And obviously there are so many things we still don't know, but the TFOS Dues 2 study has really outlined so many things. And I think one of the most important parts of this, this workshop was this definition. Dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film and accompanied by ocular symptoms in which tear film instability and hyperosmolarity, ocular surface inflammation and damage and neurosensory abnormalities play etiological roles. I think every single word in that sentence is so important and so key in understanding dry eye and ocular surface. So one of my favorite parts of this workshop is this flow chart right here. And it looks complicated, but we can go through it together. So if you have a presenting patient, we can start on the left side of this flow chart. If you have a presenting patient that's asymptomatic and there's no signs, patient is normal, done. Right, But if they're asymptomatic and they have signs of ocular surface disease, you're thinking one of two things. One is either stain without pain, which we think of neurotrophic keratitis, 
And then the other thing that we're thinking of is maybe they have signs without symptoms because they're predisposed to dry eye. They may not feel it yet, but eventually they will. So it's important, obviously, in those cases, if you are suspecting NK, which is neurotrophic keratitis, test for corneal sensitivity. And obviously that's a whole other topic out on itself. I'm not gonna go too much into NK, but it's really important to try to decipher between NK and dry eye because both of them, they can actually mimic each other and it's important to tell the difference. Then if we go to our symptomatic patients, okay, so symptomatic patients, but they have no signs, we're thinking one of two things, neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain is something that is managed completely different from the way we manage regular dry eye or dry eye with symptoms and signs. Okay, so it's very important to identify neuropathic pain because it, again, it is managed differently. They're referred for pain management. I have tried fitting scleral lenses on patients with neuropathic pain, and it's been very challenging. I'm not saying it can't work. Um, it, sometimes it could be worth a try, but neuropathic pain needs pain management and needs to be managed differently than regular dry eye that has signs and symptoms. So if a patient is symptomatic, but they've got no signs, okay, it could be that the signs are just not there yet. So it's a preclinical state. These patients need to be treated because they're symptomatic. And for example, if they ever get surgery, or like cataract surgery, for example, then they might develop signs. And so those are the patients that really, really need to be treated, especially if they're having symptoms, right? And then of course, there's a symptomatic patients with signs, okay? And then you have obviously the whole list of differential diagnoses. And once you identify dry eye disease, again, you have to identify what type of dry eye disease it is because there are two different um, types of dry eye and actually they can be mixed together, right? So you have aqueous deficient dry eye and you have evaporative dry eye. Actually, evaporative dry eye is a little bit more common but again, the etiology might be mixed. So you can have both. And the baseline is once you identify it, the key is management to restore homeostasis. Remember in the definition that you have a loss of homeostasis. So the key here is restoring it. So regardless of if you have aqueous deficient dry eye or evaporative dry eye, it's interesting that the vicious cycle is the same you either have evaporation of the tears because there's excessive evaporation like in evaporative dry eye, or you have normal evaporation, but just not enough tears, so low flow. Either way, regardless of its high evaporation or low flow, you have tear film osmolarity, which leads to tear film instability, which leads to inflammation, which leads to all of the, the release of those inflammatory mediators, which leads to symptoms, which leads to signs. And it's just a vicious circle that if it's not treated, it just gets worse and worse and perpetuates. So it's very, very important to get into this dry eye vicious cycle and interrupt it to restore homeostasis. But I think this slide is so important just to show you that regardless of whether it's aqueous deficient or evaporative, the vicious cycle is very similar. And obviously it's important to identify what is the underlying cause or is it mixed so that then we can treat it the right way to restore homeostasis. So just because it leads to the same vicious cycle doesn't mean it's managed or treated the same way. So let's talk about evaporative dry eye disease and it could be lid related. So we're really gonna focus on eyelids today. Um, I like to lecture a lot about dry eye. And in some of my lectures, I do talk a lot about aqueous deficiency, but today I'm gonna to be really focusing on eyelid disease. So what is evaporative dry eye syndrome? It could be lid related, in which case you're talking about meibomian gland dysfunction, also abbreviated MGD. It could be blink related, or it could be ocular surface related, a little bit less commonly, but we're talking about our mucin layer or a contact lens induced. So evaporative dry eye um, is something that we think may be age related, but now honestly, we're seeing so many kids with evaporative dry eye. 
with the increase in device use, with the increase of at home work, especially during the pandemic, we've seen a huge increase in dry eye in kids and mostly evaporative dry eye. So is it age related? I don't think age helps, but I don't think we can say that this is something that only affects the elderly or people over a certain age, because I definitely see a lot of kids and adolescents with dry eye. So what are some of the symptoms? Um, itching, burning, watering, redness. And what do we see? Thickened my bum, an increase in SPK, um, definitely a decrease in tear film breakup time. Uh, and then when we look at the my bum in my bombing gland dysfunction, um, what we're looking at is really a decrease in terpenoids, increase in proteins, and what we see is thicker secretions and plugging of the gland. So how do we evaluate this in clinic? Well, this is what you're going to see. A lot of the time when it comes out, if you look at the, the photo on the left, you see the consistency of the my bum when it comes out it's thick, it's like toothpaste, and we call this the toothpaste sign. So look for this. And there's two ways of really looking for this in clinic. So you can use a meibomian gland um, evaluator, or you can use your finger. Now, both of these techniques are completely different and show you completely different things. So it's important to understand the difference between this type of evaluation. So the meibomian gland evaluator that you see at the top, what you do is you gently press on the lower eyelid and it, it's going to show you which glands have a little bit of secretion coming out. So you just push very gently and the ones that top with oil are the ones that are functional. The ones that really don't do anything or don't respond are the non-functional ones. Whereas if you use your finger to express the glands, you're not really getting a qualitative result. What you're really seeing is the consistency of the glands, again, uh, of the my bum, again, that toothpaste sign. So it's a completely different exam but both of them are useful. I would say top one with the meibomian gland evaluator is a little bit more qualitative if you want to count the amount of meibomian glands that are working versus like before and after treatment type of thing. And the bottom one is more qualitative and really shows you consistency of the mind expressed from the glands. Again, both of them useful. You can do both. I personally I'm more doing the bottom one. Um, and I find that it gives me a lot of information, but especially if you're doing research or if you're really trying to evaluate the efficacy of a treatment that you're going to be doing, um, the bombing gland evaluator is really, really useful. So how do we examine my bombing glands? Well, the old school way that's existed for a long time is to use a transilluminator. Uh, that was the first way that the my bombing glands were ever visualized uh, a little bit more microscopically. So you can see there um, on the top right using a transilluminator and you can really see those glands. But thankfully we have several devices on the market that can actually show us the glands. And one of the things I really, really like about this technology is that you can show it to the patients. So, um, you know, you can use the Oculus Keratograph, the Lipis Scan, the MyBox, all of these are great, great pieces of uh, devices that you can use in your office and very user-friendly. And again, I love showing patients their meibomian glands because you can really see it's kind of that dental model when they show you your x-rays and you see the damage, you see the cavity, you see where you need your root canal. It's kind of a very similar uh, model. And I find that when patients see the deterioration and loss of their meibomian glands, they are more adamant to start a treatment, whether it's an at-home treatment, an in-office treatment, and they may be more compliant with their treatments uh, and management. So I think it's so key to do this um, and, and show patients. Another thing that can actually contribute to evaporative dry eye is the biofilm. So the biofilm is just growth of bacteria on the ocular, on the surface, on the eyelid margins that can definitely just exacerbate um, any type of blepharitis, so just anterior, posterior blepharitis. And of course, we cannot uh, ignore Demodex. Demodex is extremely common, um, and it's something that is going to be present in so many of your blepharitis patients. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about uh, Demodex in a little bit. So you're probably wondering, okay, this is a scleral lens soiree. 
why are we learning about eyelids right now? And why is this important with scleral? Uh, to, why, what does this have to do with scleral lenses? What does this have to do with scleral lens fitting? And it's really important actually. So again, we can have the best fitting scleral lens on the market. Okay. But if you have poor lens surface wettability, which is something that you might see in someone with eyelid issues, someone with blepharitis, then it doesn't matter how your lens is fitting. It doesn't matter what power you have in there. They're not going to be seeing well. They're not going to be happy with their vision. So we're going to talk a little bit about troubleshooting this later on. But again, the etiology of this is mucoid lipid and protein coating on the lens surface. You can see how oily that looks. It just doesn't look consistent. Um, and again, regardless of how centered and stable and nice the scleral lens fit is, you can see that this patient is not going to be happy. They might be uncomfortable. They might experience dryness, intermittent blurred vision. Um, they might say they have to remove um, and put back their lens on several times a day um, and just be overall just unsatisfied with their scleral lens. Another thing that we can see is debris in the tear reservoir. So this is caused by fluid dynamics under the lens, which attracts deposits in the tear reservoir. Um, and this can be if the limbal clearance is excessive, of course, we have to take the fit into consideration. And it could also be because there's no tear exchange, which just causes debris accumulation over time. But you also have to think of where this debris comes from. Is it coming from the ocular surface? Is there an ocular surface disease that's causing an excessive amount of debris buildup? And then that also has to be addressed. So again, this can cause decreased visual acuity, discomfort, inconvenient because patients will report, you know, it just gets foggy after a lot of hours. I have to remove the lens, put it back on. And of course, I'm not saying that ocular surface disease is the only culprit for midday fogging is the only culprit for debris behind the lens, but it is something that needs to be addressed. And if you see that your patient's ocular surface is not optimized, it definitely has to be treated in order to optimize the scleral lens fit and the scleral lens wear. So how do we treat, how do we manage this? Well, education is probably the most important thing. Your patients need to understand what's going on. Again, the use of mybography is something that is amazing because you can actually show your patients what's going on. You can show them the deterioration in their eyelids and you can start an at-home treatment. And I have like greatly significantly increased uh, compliance with treatments by showing patients uh, the results of mybography. So eye drops, um, preservative free, of course, eyelid hygiene, warm compresses, and omega-3. These four things are all things that patients can easily do at home. They can incorporate this into their daily routine. And sometimes just doing this is enough. Um, but again, the most important thing is education. Um, I personally like to carry products in my office so that I can recommend those products to patients. A lot of these products are available online and in stores, of course, but it's important if you show your patient what you're recommending, they're more likely to get it. Um, and again, this is all important and all of these things do have different functions in eyelid health, in dry eye. Artificial tears, uh, again, we're talking about eye drops. These are preservative free. We're talking about evaporative dry eye, right? We're talking about the quality of the tear film. So we want to pick an artificial tear that helps the tear film lipid quality by managing my bone and gland dysfunction. So you're using lipid-based artificial tear supplements, mineral oils, phospholipids. These are designed to improve tear stability and reduce tear evaporation by supplementing deficiencies in natural tear lipids. So there are a lot of different artificial tears on the market, once again, the most basic thing to remember is that these have to be preservative free. But another thing is that when we're talking about evaporative dry eye, you really want to make sure that you're choosing something that's going to restore and help maintain the quality of the tears and not just increase the volume, right? We're not trying to just allow more tears on the ocular surface. It would be nice to have more volume, but you also have to increase the, the, the quality and lipid based. And these are just some examples on the market. Um, again, preservative free, lipid based, and um, these are emulsions and sometimes a little bit thick, 
maybe not to be used with scleral lenses because they are a little bit thicker, um, but they are restoring and improving the quality of the tear film. This is something I give to all my patients when I, they're diagnosed with evaporative dry eye. It's a checklist that they can do at home. And I check off what I really think they need. Obviously there's no formula for everybody. There's no formula that's going to work for hundred percent of people. You have to cater on and kind of design a treatment for each patient based on their signs, based on their symptoms. So eyelid hygiene, um, artificial deers, again, a lot of these are available over the counter. Just make sure they're getting the preservative free um, and lipid based blinking exercises. So I'll show you what that is. There's two ways of doing that supplements. So omega-3 uh, contact lens instructions. Of course, these are scleral lens patients. So you need to explain to them when they're doing their hot compress, when they're doing their lid hygiene, what drops to use with and without their scleral lenses. Warm compresses, so important. Um, and it, I really, really emphasize this. I think this is one of the more important uh, treatments because what it does is it liquefies that my bum and helps it come out a little bit better, which maintains the function of the my glands pr and prevents loss. Um, prescription medications as well. There are some anti-inflammatory medications like cyclosporin and lefitograst. Um, sleep masks. So a lot of patients, especially in South Florida, where I live, have an AC or they have a fan over their bed. And some of them may not completely close their eye when they're sleeping. And so they can have excessive evaporation, just wake up with super, super red eyes. A lot of them may also have lit issues like ectropion or entropion. A sleep mask will help kind of seal that off. And there's some sleep masks that are actually approved for dry eye. So check that out online or in books. You can definitely find a lot of information about that. The 2020 rule is so important as something I tell hundred percent of people that have symptoms. Um, so the 2020 rule is basically when you're working on a screen or reading something for a long period of time, you have to increase your blink rate. And so it's encouraging people to take a 20 second break every 20 minutes and look 20 feet away. And it's easy to remember because it's 20, 20, 20. And it also, again, helps people blink. Blinking is so important um, and hard to remember when we're really focused on a screen or on a sheet of paper on something important that we're doing. Even when we're driving like at night and we don't know the street that well, we might not just, we might not blink enough. And so we're supposed to blink about 12 to 15 times a minute, but when we're really focused, again, especially on a screen, uh, we may be only blinking, you know, two to three times a minute. So it's important to increase that. And these blinking instructions, it's funny that you would think that an involuntary movement like blinking would need instructions. But if you ask your patients to blink behind the slit lamp, you may see that they, they're not blinking completely. They're blink, it's like an incomplete blink. So you really have to tell people to close their eyes completely, hold it there, even squeeze a little bit, and then open up again. Um, and so that they can practice that using this sheet. There's also an app for blinking um, that you can check out. It's free um, uh, in, in your store on your smartphone. So um, there's a, a bunch of ways to, to help with blinking. And this is extremely important for evaporative dry eye. So let's say you have a little bit more my bombing gland dysfunction, blepharitis, and you would like, what else can you do? Um, so the two top treatments are similar, myboflow, lipoflow. These are things that you can do in the office. They're not painful. Uh, it's about 12 to 15 minute treatment that you can do. And what it does is, again, it's heating up the upper and lower eyelids where the glands are kind of like the hot compress does, but it also does thermal pulsation, which helps kind of empty out the myboming gland, getting all that solid oil out, restoring the function of the glands, preventing further loss of further loss. And there's even studies showing that are buried and almost loss can actually regenerate with this type of treatment. 
Uh, so an excellent treatment you can see on the bottom left treatment called tear care, which is very similar. A study by Dr. Lowe right here in South Florida show very, very similar results with the tear and the flow. The good thing about tear care is that you can keep the eyes open during the treatment. Um, it's not going in the eye, it's going actually on the eyelids. It's completely customizable because you can bend um, the eyelid device. So for patients who have like some blepharon, this is not an issue, whereas lipid flow can be more difficult in those cases. Um, but you can completely change the shape of the eyelid, the smart lid device in order to fit the eyelid properly. And then if you look on the bottom, um, IPL, IPL is a one of the best treatments there are for um, my bone gland restoration, for my bone gland, um, for my GD prevention. Um, and it's something that has to be repeated a little bit more often than other treatments, um, but extremely effective FDA approved treatment for my bone gland for rosacea, just helping restore the functionality of my bone glands. Another treatment I love that I frequently do in the office, and this is just cleaning, again, the biofilm uh, Demodex as well, and just maintaining eyelid hygiene. Um, so Blefex is a treatment, it's about five minutes, it's not painful, it tickles a little bit. What you're doing is you're getting rid of deposits, you're getting rid of bacteria, again, Demodex on the eyelid surface. Um, and it's, I compare it to getting a deep dental cleaning, um, which we all do about six to eight, every six to eight months or so. And we do that like clockwork and no one actually ever told us we needed to clean our eyelashes. It's so important, especially to maintain um, the ocular surface, especially in scleral lens wares um, that have blepharitis. It's so important. Again, when you have deposits, cholerets, bacteria, just building up and even makeup, building up on the surface of the eyelashes that can get inside the eye, um, increase hyperosmolarity and just further exacerbate evaporation. And these patients have excessive evaporation of their tears. Um, RF, so RF is another type of treatment. Um, it's actually more on the cosmetic side, um, but it's a little bit new in the sense that it does restore the function of the meibomian gland. So there's studies showing that, but it also tightens the skin. So it, it has a great uh, cosmetic benefit as well. So if you have a little bit more of a cosmetic practice, this might be something that you would look into because in addition to having meibomian gland res uh, restoration and MGD prevention and dry eye prevention, you're also getting a cosmetic benefit. This is a device that I love. Uh, it's something that I've started incorporating in um, at-home treatments for my patients. So it's kind of like Blefex, um, but I would say a little bit safer for patients to use. You know, pa patients can do Blefex on themselves, but they can do new lids. So new lids is a device that is like a toothbrush. So again, very analogous to dentistry, right? We're doing the deep clean in the office, which is Blefex, which is every six months. And then at home, they can do new lids. And new lids is great to use twice a day. It comes with a gel. You can buy, you can see that there's two ways of doing it. On the top left, the guy's doing it with his eyes closed. And on the bottom left, she was doing it with her eyes open. So when we talk about blepharitis, we cannot ignore Demodex. It, they just come hand in hand. Um, and actually 100% of blepharitis patients with cholerets have demodex mites. So we used to think, okay, we need a microscope, we need fluorescein, stain them with fluorescein, put them under the microscope and see the mites. You really don't need to, because if you see cholerets, it's actually pathognomonic for demodex. So you want to confirm the presence of cholerets uh, to confidently make the diagnosis. Again, 100% of people with cholerets have demodex. So what are cholerets? They're composed of mite waste and eggs. 
regurgitated undigested material combined with epithelial cells, keratin, mite eggs, and digestive enzymes which cause irritation. It causes this translu translucent waxy plugs that are typically at the base of the lashes. So if you think you haven't seen Demodex, you're probably wrong. It's extremely common. You really, really, really have to look for it to find it. So clinical suspicion is all you need now. Um, and a slit lamp in order to see the collarettes. So you can just ask the patients to look down in order to visualize the collarettes. So what is it epidemiology? We can see here, it's extremely common, okay? And what it can cause is just, again, an increase in hyperosmolarity, but also blurring of vision. It can cause misdirection of lashes, um, and it can cause irritation, redness, um, and there's a, an extremely high overlap of patients that have uh, blepharitis and demodex. So it's important to remember that if you are diagnosing a patient with blepharitis, look for demodex because there's actually 69% of patients with blepharitis also have demodex. Now, this is extremely important again, a patient that's wearing scleral lenses, okay, because they're, again, wearing scleral lenses, you can treat the ocular surface, but if you don't treat the demodex, it's going to recur, and they're still going to have a hyperosmolarity, and they're still going to have discomfort. So you cannot just treat the blepharitis. With everything I just told you, I talked about at-home treatments, I talked about in-office treatments, those are great, but a lot of them will not take care of the demodex part, and it's important to really, really look for it. And if you see it, you really have to treat it. So, and also if you are referring these patients for surgery, for a surgery of any kind, surgery will increase inflammation on an eye that's already inflamed, whether it's from blepharitis or demodex, they will just be exacerbated. And the last thing you want patients to think is that they got dry eye from the surgery or they got dry eye from the lenses that you're fitting. It was there before, it just has to be addressed and it has to be managed in order to, again, optimize the ocular surface, whether it's for surgery or a scleral lens or any type of contact lens. So what are demodex mites? They're associated with acne vulgaris, folliculitis, rosacea, perioral and scalp hair loss, basal cell carcinoma. Um, it's implicated in the disease of the lids, lid margin, MGD. There's two kinds. There's one that's a little bit smaller, uh, about 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 in length. In length, they're found in clusters around the lash follicles, and that's where it feeds on follicular epithelial cells. And then there's the demodex brevis, which is shorter, and it actually prefers the meibomian gland. Both species are translucent, elongated microscopic mites. Um, and they basically have clawed legs and it's gross, but they're there. 80% of patients with demodex blepharitis will have symptoms and they will have complaints on a daily basis. And so what are some of these symptoms that the patients will have? They'll talk about eyes that burn, irritated eyes, eyes that itch, gritty eyes, dry eyes, blurry vision, crusty eyes. I mean, this has to be taken care of if you're fitting a scleral lens. You cannot just fit a scleral lens and ignore this because the patients will not be happy. And we want our patients that are wearing scleral lenses to be happy. We want them to feel like they're seeing better, that we save their vision, that we restore their comfort, but these things have to be addressed. So ask your patients to look down um, this can help reveal diffuse collarettes, misdirected lashes. So if you've ever seen this, I mean, on a slit lamp examination, this is Demodex. Okay. Um, again, hundred percent of blepharitis patients with collarettes had Demodex mites. So how do we take care of Demodex? Um, tea tree oil is basically what we've been using up until now. It's toxic for Demodex. Also, Demodex does feed off of bacteria. So if we clean the biofilm, if they're doing new lids, if they're doing eyelid hygiene, if they're doing Blefex, this can help reduce um, its bacteriostatic for Demodex, but it's definitely not toxic to them the way that tea tree oil is. 
a little bit newer on the market and actually in stage three clinical trials right now is a product by Tarsus. Um, there is actually no FDA approved uh, treatment right now, but this is in the works, so exciting. Um, this is a novel therapeutic design um, basically to eradicate the Demodex mice and treat demodex blepharitis. So this is an eye drop. It's a multi-dose eye drop solution. It is preserved. Um, it is basically causing paralysis and death of demodex mites. And again, it's twice a day for about six weeks. And basically the efficacy goal of it is basically to cure the cholerets, eradicate the mites, reduce redness, and again, cure cholerets. Um, so far, according to studies, it's got a pretty good safety profile. So if you look on the left graph, you can actually compare um, the TP03, which is the product, to the vehicle and look at the mite eradication, which is the y-axis. So you can really see how much more effective it is than placebo or vehicle alone. And then if we talk about uh, the mean mite density over time, you can see a significant reduction in Demodex using TP03 and obviously not the same effect using the vehicle. So these are so far statistically significant results showing good results, showing that this might actually work in Demodex and be something that we will use in our patients with Demodex again, twice a day for six weeks right now. So extremely safe. Uh, patients are reporting uh, that it was neutral, very comfortable. Obviously, there's always maybe some people with some side effects like pain or burning upon installation uh, or discharge. Um, but again, you know, you do have underlying factors here, patients with Demodex, and, and they could have that exacerbating, again, the dry eye and stinging sensations. Um, so uh, overall, just a safe drop to use, and I'm excited for this to come out so I can start using it. So back to our scleral lenses. Okay, we were talking about poor lens surface wettability. So if we talk about poor lens surface wettability, the first thing you want to think about is ocular surface disease. And you will find this in every single scleral lens article, scleral lens book. Yes, we might have to fix something with the material. We might have to put hydropeg and I'll talk about that. But the first thing you want to look at is really the ocular surface. And one thing I always tell my patients is I will do everything I can on my end to make this the best scleral lens possible. But you have to do things on your end in order to take care of your ocular surface because I see this issue Meibomian gland dysfunction, demodex, anterior blepharitis, um, just eyelid hygiene in general. If you don't address that, then the scleral lens is just not going to perform the way it's supposed to. So managing eyelid and ocular surface diseases, review skincare and makeup regimen. So maybe some patients also have concomitant rosacea. Um, that can be addressed with things like IPL. It can be addressed dermatologically as well. Um, and omega-3 is great as well for those patients. And then makeup, makeup is oily. Um, so always makeup after contact lenses. Um, for all of our patients, makeup goes on after. And sometimes if they're putting on a lot or even creams after, um, it can just get on the ocular surface and cause an oily film. So you wanna make sure that whatever they're using is not too oily and they're not putting it on excessively. So just maybe limit the amount of makeup that they're putting around on the eyelashes, on the lid margin, maybe change the, the makeup regimen a little bit. Um, but again, after, if you have, you just finished putting on makeup and then you're putting on and taking off your scleral lenses, it can cause a lot of discomfort and oily tear, uh, oily film on the surface. So improve your cleaning regimen. Um, there's extra strength, alcohol-based cleaners, peroxide. These are really good at disinfecting, cleaning the lenses. Sometimes you can ask your patients just to take a Q-tip and just wet it with a solution or a DMV plunger and just wet it with a solution just to wipe the deposits off. 
You might have to make some modifications to your lens though. You might have to select a material with a lower wetting angle. You might also want to add hydropeg. Hydropeg improves the interaction between the surface of the lens and the tear film. And you definitely want to have plasma treatment, which most lenses come with anyway. But hydropeg is something that you can add to boost a little bit the interaction of the lens with the ocular surface. Then we talk about debris in the tear reservoir. Again, the first troubleshooting tip on this list is assessing and treating any ocular surface disease. So today we focus on eyelids, um, but it's important to look for GPC. It's important to look for aqueous deficient dry eye as well. Um, and definitely eyelids is, is a huge one. Okay. The, the friction of the blink can cause so much discomfort and just completely disrupt the way your scleral lens is fitting. So it really, really has to be addressed. Again, you can troubleshoot the lens fitting. So you might have to modify your peripheral curves. And I'm sure the other speakers have and will continue talking to you about um, customizing peripheral curves on scleral lenses. So I'm not gonna focus on that, but you do want to maybe flatten curves to minimize impact on the conjunctiva. Obviously having a curve that's a little bit too steep can cause um, the, creation and negative pressure causing those metabolic debris to, to be sucked underneath. Modifying the curves to reduce the limbal clearance sometimes. What I have patients do sometimes is actually take a more viscous solution and mix it with an art of, you know, like a viscous artificial tear with the saline inside the bowl before application. Um, so you can actually ask a patient to just flush their lens with saline. And obviously, you know, the last resort is just removing the lens and putting it back in because this can actually exacerbate inflammation on the ocular surface. It's kind of like a fishing syndrome where you're removing it, putting it back on, removing it, putting it back on might actually cause a little bit more midday fogging or debris in the tear reservoir. So obviously a last resort, but sometimes you really don't have an option, an option, especially if you're in the middle of your fitting process. And this is something that, you know, you're going to resolve or in the middle of your ocular surface disease and eyelid hygiene kind of embetterment and management treatment. So it's interesting that we talk about, you know, we have to optimize the ocular surface in order to improve scleral lens wear but scleral lenses can actually used to treat ocular surface disease. So it's very, very interesting. And it's so, it's kind of like, you have to treat the ocular surface in order to improve the way your scleral lens feels, the vision, the stability, but you can actually use a scleral lens to treat the ocular surface. It's very interesting how intertwined these two topics are. And the tfos dues 2 study does talk about the, the use of scleral lenses for treating the ocular surface. And so you can see this four plus severe SPK in a 70 year old white female. Scleral lens is like an oasis on the ocular surface. It creates a tear film reservoir, which you can fill with anything from autologous serum tears to regenerize to preservative free artificial tears and even preservative free antibiotic in order to help restore the ocular surface. So you can create a cocktail like, of a treatment that you put on the ocular surface, which just helps restore the ocular surface and, and improve and heal it and maintain it and preserve it. And you can see the result of that four plus severe SPK, just so much better using a scleral lens after a few weeks. So very interesting but we still have to treat the eyelids, okay? So obviously you have the ocular surface disease that we're treating with the scleral lens, but again, really highly have to maximize eyelid health in these patients. And I will never fit a scleral lens on a patient without taking a look at their meibomian glands. And I encourage all of you scleral lens practitioners here to do the same because it is so common, especially today, that really, really has to be addressed. So let's talk about some application solutions. Um, I can't emphasize how important it, it is to have preservative-free 
uh, solutions. So you want to use preservative free saline. Um, these are some examples. Most of them are FDA approved. And then again, preservative free artificial tears. Um, and you can use autologous serum, you can use Regenerize, all of these will have benefits for the ocular surface and you can use these inside the bowl of the lens. I was talking about heavy cleaners. Um, if you're using cleaners to really remove debris off of the surface of the lens, you might wanna use something a little bit stronger like peroxide based solutions. Um, and yeah, it's just really important to maximize everything. So ask what solutions your patients are using ask what artificial tears your patients are using. There are so many artificial tears available in stores and patients just don't know which one is good, which one is bad. It's not like any of them are bad, but some of them might be better for the, 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 the problem that they have, especially if it's eyelid related. A lot of the time, you know, I have patients coming in and they're using completely wrong, some of them are using soft contact lens solution to fill um, their scleral lens and then put it on the eye or they're using preserved saline. I mean, we all know the damage that preservatives can do to the ocular surface based on our glaucoma patients. We see how preservative can really damage the ocular surface. And so it's so important what we're trying to do with the scleral lens is really restore, preserve, improve the vision. And so really important to use preservative free application solutions, important to use when we can preservative free cleaning solutions. And if they are using artificial tears of preservative free artificial tears. So there are preservative free artificial tears, so many of them on the market. Um, you can use them out with or without the lenses. Again, the ones that are lipid based and the ones that are more emulsions are a little bit thicker. So in order for that to really, to, it, the reason is twofold why I ask them not to wear their scleral lens. One, because it's a little bit thicker, so it might blur their vision a little bit. And the other reason is that there, there's not a lot of tear film exchange with a scleral lens. And so if you're trying to get that emulsion to the ocular surface, to the cornea, it might be better and you'll have a little bit better penetration um, or effect actually, if you use without, if you use it without the scleral lens on. Um, so another thing you wanna do is if you are using anything with like an anti-inflammatory drop like cyclosporin or lefitograst, or anything else, you definitely want to wait about 10 minutes before putting the lens back on because you don't want um, the anything to just overflow. You don't want it to be stuck behind the scleral lens. You really want it to get to the ocular surface. No sleeping with scleral lenses. Um, and a lot of the things that I do at the beginning, especially if a patient has a lot, a lot of ocular surface disease or eyelid issues, is that I will ask them to build up their wear over time. So I'll ask them to start with two hours and then they can increase with four to four hours the next day, six hours the next day. So this helps one, get used to the scleral lens. And two, if you are treating the ocular surface, it does help kind of that ocular surface treatment kick in prior to being like a full-time scleral lens wear. So another thing you want to do is really ask the patients to wear their lenses to their follow-up appointments, and that will allow you to see the cornea, the eyelids, and how the lens is interacting with the ocular surface um, all the way up until, you know, the appointment time. And then you can remove it and look at all the structures of the eye and make sure everything is intact. So that's it for me. I'm going to take some questions if there are any. I think I do see. Yes. Yeah, so lots of questions um, that we have. Great lecture, great presentation. This is such an important topic for really anybody that's wearing contacts. Dr. Kramer, there are some questions. Um, first question from Dr. Lynn, does hypochlorous acid treat demodex? So hypochlorous acid is treating the blepharitis, anterior blepharitis. So is the biofilm on the, on, the, on the lid margin, but it doesn't actually target demodex. 
So there are studies showing that there's less Demodex if you use hypochlorous acid, because a lot of the time the Demodex is feeding off of that biofilm. So if you take care of the biofilm, then indirectly, you're also taking care of the blepharitis, but it's not directly addressing the Demodex issue. And so that's why we revert to um, we revert to tea tree oil and hopefully uh, the TPO3 by Tarsus really soon because we want something that directly addresses the Demodex. So even though hypochlorous acid is a great product for the biofilm, again, it's not addressing Demodex directly. Great. And, doc and kind of piggybacking off of that, Dr. Yamamoto wants to know what are the main causes of Demodex? So we don't really know. It just happens. It could be related to other skin conditions. It could be uh, excessive biofilm. Again, I talked about how biofilm is kind of something that Demodex will live off of. Age, we know is definitely related, but we cannot say it's cause and effect. So I don't think there's like a cause and effect uh, association that we can really pinpoint. But what we do know is that it's extremely common and it has nothing to do with like hygiene. It's not like someone doesn't shower enough so they have more Demodex, someone doesn't wash it. It just happens and some people are more prone than others, but because it's so common, we really have to look for it. And again, treat it and address it properly. Great. And next question is, how do you recommend application of tea tree oil to treat the Demodex? So there's a few ways to do it. Um, tea tree oil is very strong. Um, so you cannot get, you can get it from a compound pharmacy, but you shouldn't get it in like pure concentration. So when I was first starting to treat dry eye, I did about 80% coconut oil, 20% uh, tea tree oil combination that I would apply in the office. But you can actually, there's a bunch of products on um, the market right now that have tea tree oil. So eyelid wipes um, like Blefidex, like Clearidex, like there's a bunch of them that actually have tea tree oil in them. And look at studies. There are some studies of just a, a few products being effective with Demodex. So it's important to look at those, but those are available. So you don't have to use compounding anymore. You can actually get um, tea tree oil wipes, sprays on the market for your patients. Awesome. And a couple of questions uh, on the same, basically the same question, Dr. Inowski and Dr. Staley want to know what fish oil do you recommend? You talked about omega-3s, other certain types. What happens if somebody's a vegan? Okay. Great question. Uh, all of those. So it's important if you are addressing dry eye, to target something that has been shown in studies to work for dry eyes, specifically blepharitis. Um, there's so many omega-3s on the market and they all have different ratios of EPA to DHA. The ones that I recommend are the ones have, that have been studied and shown benefits for patients with blepharitis, for patients with dry eyes. So a few examples would be hydro eye, would be PRN, and there are many more. If you have a patient that's a vegan, you're a little bit more limited, but there are some vegan ones as well. So look into it, ask your consultants, ask the, um, the reps from those uh, pharmaceutical companies to help you find something that is vegan, but there is availability. And again, I can't emphasize enough, you're choosing something that has been shown in studies to work for dry eye and ocular surface disease. Great. A uh, question from Dr. Williams Lynn. Is there any information as to when TP3 is going to have to be repeated after the first, you know, session? Great question. I don't have the answer to that, but I'm looking forward to seeing more information come out of Tarsus and uh, FDA approval, and then we'll have answers to those questions. But great question. This is a good one from Dr. Kikuchi. I've heard that IPL can eradicate Demodex. Yeah, I think it does actually. It actually does work with Demodex. Yeah, I've heard that too. And a lot of my patients that I've referred for IPL when they come back, their Demodex is much better. So yeah. I, yeah. I definitely have seen that. Um, here's another good question from Dr. Nguyen. Although the treatments kill the Demodex, does it clear the dead Demodex from the tissue as it might trigger an inflammatory response. 
Correct. And, and that's where your biofilm comes in. Um, you know, you, you are killing the Demodex, but you definitely want to get rid of it cleaning, whether it's with Blefex, new lids, or just wipes, sprays at home. Um, baby, sh we're past the baby shampoo and we're past the, you know, soap or acne cleanser to remove the biofilm. We have products for this. And so, yes, you don't want to just kill it. You really do have to clean the biofilm off and make this part of your patient's daily routine. You know, we all brush and floss and all of that. I keep bringing up the dental model because it's such an exemplary model that we've been following for years. And I'm just excited for people to get on the dry eye hygiene bandwagon. And kind of on that same, I mean, I know we're talking tons about eyelids, which was the whole talk. Uh, what are your comments on tea tree oil and actually hurting the meibomian glands? Uh, I don't think there's any evidence for that. Um, I think, again, it's really important on the concentration that you're using. The one I, I talked about compounding, but I really highly encourage you to choose a product that has been studied, that has been shown to work. The ones that are usually recommended for blepharitis, for Demodex, um, have been shown in studies to work and have a, a good safety profile. So I can't say I would use anything on the market that would cause damage to my bombing glands because I'm so concerned about my bombing gland health and my patients. So again, read up on the studies and obviously only prescribe something that you feel comfortable uh, prescribing. Great. And Dr. Herman asks, I've heard that ivermectin can help eradicate Demodex. Is that correct? I haven't heard that, but uh, something to look into. Uh, Dr. Brill wants to make note that uh, zocular products, which work really well in the zest treatment, um, and, and I, we've used them before as well. I'm not sure if you have any experience with those. Yes, um, I, I, you know, I couldn't mention every single product on the market. <laughs> Uh, because then we would be here for three hours, but there are so many products and Zocular is a great product that we also use. Um, and we use it in our in office treatments as well. Great. Um, another good question is, do you have any thoughts on the refresh eye drop? Like the, oh, I think it's called mega three refresh. Oh. It's got the flaxseed oil in it. Yeah. As long as it's preservative free, um, and that one is, it's, it's a great drop. It, it, it is lipid based, so it should improve, um, the quality of the tear film, um, whether it improves the ratio of EPA and DHA. Um, I don't know. I would have to see studies on, you know, I feel, I still think it's important for patients to take oral omega-3, um, and especially, you know, systemically, we don't have good penetration of eye drops in the systemic, you know, in, in the body. So it's important, you know, to increase those, those products through oral intake of omega-3 and not just rely on an eye drop, but certainly a good, great drop is refresh and the omega-3 does have lipid based emulsion. So it's great. Excellent. And then last question Dr. Inowski asks, do you use mybography as a general screener for all patients or are you reserving that exclusively for dry eye patients? That's a great question. I would say if you do have mybography, do it for everyone that will just sit there like as young as five to 95 or whatever. Um, in my practice, I tend to do it for patients that are symptomatic. Um, and if they're not symptomatic, the patients that have signs, because then I can actually treat it. If I see signs um, or symptoms or both, I will do it because that will allow me to find the correct treatment. I don't leave my patients that have complaints, whether it's visual fluctuations or discomfort alone. I always look for what it could be. Again, the treatment of management is so different if you talk about aqueous deficiency or if you talk about evaporative dry ice, it's really important to identify this. They have any signs or symptoms or both, it's very important to do mybography and, and check the meibomian glands. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dr. Kramer. That was an amazing presentation as always.